Yeah, um, I'm Mark Rifkin. I'm the director of the Women's and Gender Studies Program and Professor of English at UNC Greensboro. I'm your cruise director for this part of our program. Um, so I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on the lands of Tuscarora and Saponi peoples. They largely were dispossessed of their lands prior to the US Revolutionary War, and so they do not have treaties with the federal government for lands in what is now North Carolina. Some Tuscarora people went north in the early 19th century and joined with their relatives in the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Confederacy, which thus became the Six Nations. Many other Tuscaroras moved to what is now Robeson County, and they remain there today. Saponi peoples continue to live in Southern Virginia and across the Piedmont area in North Carolina. Uh, there are eight tribes recognized by the state of North Carolina, the Eastern Band of Cherokee, Kohari, Lumbee, Halawa Saponi, Saponi, Meheran, Okanichi Band of Saponi Nation, and uh, Wickamaw Suen. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Kim Tolbert. She is Associate Professor in the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta, where she holds a Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Peoples, Technoscience, and Environment. Dr. Tallbear received her PhD in the History of Consciousness from UC Santa Cruz, and she also has served on the faculty of UC Berkeley and UT Austin. She's an enrolled member of the Sisseton Wapatin Oyate, Oyade, excuse me. She explicitly has asked me to keep this intro fairly brief and not to spend too much time praising her work and its importance. I will attempt to honor this request. Well, honor it-ish. In her book, Native American DNA, Tribal Belonging and the False Promise of Genetic Science, Talbert conducts ethnographic research on those non-natives who would seek to define native identity in genetic terms. With respect to the logic of genetic testing, she argues that it, quote, refers to ancestral populations that are inferred for an individual based on a specific set of genetic markers, a specific set of algorithms for assessing genetic similarity, and a specific set of reference populations. But each of those constitutive elements operates within a loop of circular reasoning, end quote. And she further suggests of the conceptions of mixture that proliferate within geno genomic discourses and modes of testing, quote, of course, mixing is predicated on the notion of purity, the historical construction of continental spaces and concomitant grouping of humans into races is the macro frame of reference for the human genome diversity researcher, end quote. Talbert repudiates the racializing logic by which Indianness gets pinioned to a particular set of genetic markers and by which indigeneity gets colonially recast as an innate substance whose purity or authenticity can be lost, thereby confirming ideologies of inevitable vanishing and disappearance. She asks, quote, what is the tribe for the purposes of genetic sampling and testing? The tribe is not, strictly speaking, a genetic population. It is at once a social, legal, and biological formation with those respective parameters shifting in relation to one another, end quote. The pressing import of this work for the present moment can be summed up in two words, Elizabeth Warren. I have assigned the book in my Intro to Feminist Theory courses at both the undergraduate and graduate levels because I think it does crucial work in contesting dominant notions of the body that seek to dislodge corporeality from the complex and shifting webs of interdependence and connection with humans and other than human entities that constitute fleshly being, everyday sociality, and historical becoming. In Native American DNA, Talbert offers a powerful reconceptualization of the meaning of discourses of blood when employed by Native peoples. Not simply referring to a quantum of racial Indianness, blood, Talbert insists, is a way of figuring relation, quote, the counting of relatives and establishing a genealogical connection to them is also clearly at play in our blood talk. We use the language of blood and blood fractions while keeping in mind a specific world of policy and while bearing in mind that that language is shorthand for what we know is a far more complicated story of our lineages, end quote. Talbert's work seeks to think beyond the thingification of indigenous personhood and peoplehood, their reduction to reified units by which to measure, assess, and evaluate native purity, authenticity, respectability, and worthiness for recognition. 
Her more recent work is an extension of that refusal of settler-imposed stasis and normativity, exploring how polyamory and non-monogamy can provide intellectual frames and ethical principles for understanding native pasts and presence and envisioning vibrant indigenous futures. She addresses how we can see the nuclear family as a technology of settlement in ways continuous continuous with the more evidently technological mechanics of something like genetic testing. Tall Bear repeatedly comes back to the exploration of not simply how the personal is political, but how the intimacies of interpersonal relation constitute the basis for indigenous political orders. As against settler calculations, classifications, and calcifications, Tall Bear offers feminist pathways for engaging and strengthen strengthening indigenous sovereignties and self-determination. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kim Tall Bear. This doesn't go up, does it? Does this go up? No? Yeah, no. No. <laughs> okay. Stuff's designed for short people <laughs> and men, <laughs> as this is on my back. Okay. All right, sorry about that. And let's look down too much. Thank you, everybody, for, for showing up. I'm always very um, flattered uh, and honored to have good audiences. And I try not to bore people because you have come out and been so generous with your time. So I'll jump right in. Um, before I do, though, I just I didn't know Mark was going to do a land acknowledgement, which I appreciate. They don't you don't do that in the United States as much as we do in Canada. So I'm I tend to be prepared. Does this work? Yes. So I had a map of the tribes of North Carolina which I think you mentioned, I'm glad you got to pronounce them and not me, because you've had more practice. I, I've worked with Eastern Band in Lumbee. Um, uh, I used to be a tribal environmental planner, and so I've worked all over the US, all through Indian, Indian country, as we call it. That's a legal term with tribes all over the country. And, but I haven't worked with some of these other tribes that are not, I think, as active on the national scene. I, there's probably federal and state recognized mixed in here, right? Anyway, whoops, what happened? I don't know what happened. OK. Anyway, so that's just to give you a sense. I, um, I don't know how much people talk about this or, or know about the tribal presence in North Carolina. All right, so I'll go to the next one. Well, I guess I'll just stay here and give you my intro. So we live in a world, uh, in an era of global decimation, dubbed by some the Anthropocene. Settler colonial states, including the US and Canada, disproportionately consume the world. As we reconsider violent human practices and conceive of new ways of living with our relations, both human and other than human, in the face of a feared apocalypse, we must also interrogate settler sexuality and family constructs that make land, humans, and other beings into property. Post-apocalyptic for centuries, indigenous peoples have been disciplined by the state according to monogamous, heteronormative, marriage-focused nuclear family ideals rooted in private property that are central to this colonial project. Settler sexualities and their unsustainable kin forms do not only harm humans, they harm the earth too. I consider how indigenous concepts of relations, including with more than humans, can serve as a provocation for moving into more sustainable and just relations for more than just indigenous peoples. The bulk of my work is focused on forms of genetic science that construct racial categories as both methods and justification for control of indigenous and other bodies. My newer work builds on this to challenge compulsory monogamy and hetero and homonormative couple-centric marriage. Nathan Rambukana of Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo calls such relationship forms intimate privilege. And they've gone hand in hand with discourses of evolution and race. The imposition of monogamy and marriage have been important techniques for state management of indigenous and other human bodies, and they're central to the management of the land. I also want to apologize, too. I, ha I have Invisalign, and I'm trying really hard not to lisp. It's really hard to talk with these things in. So <clears throat> Scott's work in the uh, 
Oh yeah, I, <laughs> I was, gave a talk at Queens recently and I called Scott Morganson Scott, everybody was in the room. So uh, Scott Morganson's work and the work of other anthropologists and historians of Euro-American settlement, marriage and monogamy in the US and Canada show how it was not only indigenous people that were forced into monogamy and state sanctioned marriage, those relationship forms were intimately tied up with the appropriation of indigenous collectively held land and its division into individual allotments to be held privately. Men as heads of household qualified for a certain acreage, 160 acres generally. They obtained more, 80 acres if they had a wife, and they'd get another 40 acres for each child. So women were then, of course, tied to men economically. Accordingly, compulsory monogamy and marriage have been forced on other more than monogamous and sometimes non-Christian communities as well. So settler sexuality can be translated more straightforwardly as both hetero and homonormative forms of love, sex, and marriage that are produced along with private property holding in the US and Canada. Um, oh, you know what I did? Let's see. I skipped over his... Uh, well, you can read it though, right? <laughs> so, so these are Scott's pithy little definitions. The uh, settler sexuality is the heteropatriarchal and sexual modernity exemplary of white settler civilization. Or if that's too succinct, you've got the second one. A white national heteronormativity and increasingly also homonormativity that regulates indigenous sexuality and gender by supplanting them with the sexual modernity of settler subjects. And Scott's work, for those who haven't read it in the Spaces Between Us, that's what it's called, it talks about the role of uh, increasing homonormati homonormativity in like US nationalism, fantastic work. And it's been very helpful for those of us in indigenous studies as well. I don't know if this artist wants me using this <laughs> painting as a critique, I, they probably hope they meant it as a critique. So that's, that's what we aspire to in our communities now. Not me, but a lot of people do, okay. So I want to give another terminology note as well, in addition to the settler sexuality uh, term, which is, you know, quite common and pervasive in Canada, but I, I'm losing, I've been out of the U.S. for three and a half years now, so I lose touch a little bit at what some of the kind of more normative things are down here. Um, so the other terminology note is there are vibrant conversations in Canada and the U.S. that debate the applicability of the term settler and suggests new terms for non-racially privileged non-indigenous groups, e.g. African Americans or recent non-white or non-Christian immigrants who enter the US or Canada due to conditions of war and violence, in many cases due to settler state imperialism abroad. So when I use the term settler, I am not interested in nitpicking around who is and is not a settler on an individual level. There are no untroubled definitions of that category. Instead, I focus on settler colonial state power, including its cultural power, which all of its citizens are capable of shoring up. I see non-indigenous racially disadvantaged citizens as potentially complicit in settler colonial appropriations of indigenous resources. I don't like that word, but I have to use it. And many of us across racial and religious lines have been made complicit in helping uphold settler forms of sex. I'm sorry, can so I need a Kleenex. Does somebody have one handy? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so quick. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Melchen 101, who reads Melchen? Mel's awesome, great. This is really basic. <laughs> So, so there's an established hierarchy between humans and other than humans. That human-animal divide is co-constituted with hierarchies established between humans. Animal is a term that is used to denigrate particular humans as savage or less evolved. In North America, settler categorization and management of land and water as common or privately owned, as uh, conserved or open for exploitation and development has been entangled with state management of women, children, enslaved people, indigenous peoples, and more than human bodies. Such bodies have been seen as less evolved, as in need of taming, as ripe for exploitation and development. Vulnerable bodies like vulnerable other than human bodies, vulnerable earth and water bodies have been objects of intervention, knowledge production and control. Perhaps an even more fundamental binary or hierarchy of life than that of civilized versus savage or culture versus nature, binaries commonly applied to women, indigenous people, people of color, queers, the disabled, 
but a more common binary or fundamental might be that of life versus not life. Mel Chen describes an animacy hierarchy that deanimates certain bodies below others with humans and white heterosexual males among us occupying the highest perch. Monogamy and marriage are also part of sustaining an animacy hierarchy in which some bodies are viewed as more animate, alive, and vibrant. So I have an example. How many of you who, haven't, who aren't in couples, like that everybody can see, you notice how other couples don't invite you anywhere? And then when you get in a couple, they suddenly invite you to dinner and out, yeah, they're deanimating you. <laughs> I know they don't know it, but I notice. My ex-husband came to town and we're good friends and suddenly all these couples invited us out to dinner. I'm like, oh really? <laughs> so. Um, so I situate a critique of compulsory monogamy and marriage, not only within feminist, indigenous, and queer critiques of settler sexuality, but also within indigenous and queer critiques of that divide between humans and more than humans. I also draw on scholarship that helps us see the possibilities for disaggregating these objects, sexuality, spirituality, nature, Um, that a settler worldview has made for us as it seeks to modernize us and evolve us into citizens, citizens absorbable into a white nation, although they go back and forth on that one. So rather, I suggest that we can focus on understanding both sexuality and spirituality and nature as sets of relations and power exchange between humans and between humans and other powerful beings. Settler relations, be that marriage and a focus on reproductive sex between humans or forms of hierarchical intimacy between humans and nature, is not economically, emotionally, and materially sustainable for lots of persons, both indigenous and not, both human and not. Rather, indigenous relationality and other critical relations can offer us more sustainable intimacies for the planet. So I really do thank Mel for informing my thinking in that area. So this leads me to a conversation about ecosexuality. Who knows about ecosexuality? Fewer than know about Mel Chen. <laughs> That's interesting. Until I spent time in the Bay Area, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't like California, but I do miss my relations out there, my human relations. The land is not, that's not my, uh, I'm not in love with that, those land relations out there. So Beth Stevens and Annie Sprinkles, ecosexual activism, art, and scholarship has been generative for me since 2012 when I first walked with them in, the, in San Francisco's Dyke March. So I was just went over to have brunch with them that day, and they're like, oh, we're the ecosexuals. It was like four or five of them at the time. We're going to market march today at the Dyke March. Do you want to go? And I was like, well, OK, because <laughs> I'm an anthropologist of white people, so I thought this would be really interesting. <laughs> So there was really funny, then you, you know, I'm talking about sexuality, so I'm going to swear a little bit, but <laughs> there was this, so it's these, you know, older women marching, and then there was these, like, you know, cool youngins out there on the side, it's all really cool, and I'm sure looking at these old ladies, and they were like, who wants to fuck a tree? That's weird, you know, <laughs> so, which is a question you often get, so it was very interesting. A lot of interesting anthropology that day. So then I went home and I, and I, I blogged, but they're good friends of mine, so they, they know. So I went home and I blogged about this concept as a friendly but not uncritical indigenous analyst of ecosexuality. It just really started my brain firing. And then I got raked over the coals. So a prominent Cherokee Nation citizen, now that's the Cherokee tribe in Oklahoma, not the one here, um, referred to my ecosexual colleagues as quote unquote nasty women and accused ecosexuality, Annie in particular, of indigenous cultural appropriation. Now this is because of her past association with a sex educator who is recognized by indigenous people as a new age appropriator. Harley something, I forget, Swift, he's a fake. Anyway, in the view of the Cherokee citizen, the ecosexual motif looked to him to overlap with new age practices, although he admitted he didn't really read my post, which was pretty extensive. He also seemed to confuse Annie Sprinkle with another porn actor who claims to be part Cherokee. The part Cherokee is a really important phrase. That, that kind of clues you into people who are not connected to community. We don't say that. We just say we are or we're not. So while Annie has always been clear about her Jewish upbringing, she's very clear about that. She's written about that for anybody who's written her, so she's never claimed to be Cherokee. The Cherokee citizen who is himself gay identified went even further. He worried that the gay community becomes a haven for, quote, every sexual drag society has to offer, G-L-B-T-I-I-Q-L-M-F-A-O, unquote. 
And now we should add E to that already two multiple term. The problem, according to him, began when lesbians refused the gay moniker. This Cherokee citizen is sometimes controversial, but he does demand respect in his profession and among some Cherokee. He is also known to be an explicitly anti-racist supporter of the freedmen, African-American Cherokee citizens who have been fighting disenfranchisement from the Cherokee nation, so people's politics are complicated. But it's not only this Cherokee Nation citizen who's triggered by ecosexuality. I've had many students, when I teach the material, also worry about cultural appropriation, although I'm yet to be convinced that this is happening, at least by the ecosexuals I've been in conversation with, although I'm sure they're careful. <laughs> so <laughs> I mostly see people avoid invocations of indigenous references, and I look for them, and I will call them out if I see them. The risk of indigenous appropriation is clearly important, though, because it repeatedly comes up in my courses. And I've taught this, materially, this material at um, UC Berkeley in the College of Natural Resources, where I taught in the small social science and humanities society and environment section. I've taught it at the University of Texas in anthropology courses when I was there. And now I've taught it at the University of Alberta in our Faculty of Native Studies. So really geographically and racially and ethnic class diverse departments. Um, I also should say, given that, that experience that I've had, that ecosexuality is most pointedly criticized as potentially appropriative by my non-indigenous students. So they're really worried about it. Um, both whites and non-indigenous people of color. And again, this has happened at all three of those universities. Uh, so white and non-indigenous students of color have been very critical at all three. Um, I've had very, I, at Berkeley, I had very few, if any, indigenous students in my courses. At Texas, I had a couple. Um, and of course, uh, my, my undergraduate upper division classes at the University of Alberta, we do have a lot of non-native majors, which is great. So they're usually about 50-50 indigenous and non-indigenous students. But since I always have words like sex, race, queer, or whatever in my courses, my, all my, all my uh, non-native students tend to be the queer kids from gender and women's studies. <laughs> and, then, and then they kind of self-segregate on two sides of the room, even though they know each other and they take classes together. And that, so it's interesting, right? They're like, they're very friendly, but they all sit it's very interesting. So I, I do anthropology on my students, but I don't, not really. Um, so at the U of A, um, what happens with my, my indigenous students, and they'll, they'll be raised both in land-based communities and in, in Edmonton is such a, there's so many native people there. So it's urban, but it's, it's a very native landscape as is Saskatoon, as is Winnipeg. It's, so there's not that they talk about it as an urban-rural divide, but I also see these urban landscapes as very vibrant indigenous spaces. Um, and so the native students will just kind of laugh and say, oh, that's kind of weird. <laughs> like, oh, it's more weird white people stuff. But they don't, they don't really first and foremost talk about the potential for appropriation. But what does come up in class frequently is the issue of consent. Um, so, and again, it's my non-native students who will often say that, you know, other than humans can't consent to sex with a human. And I like what ecosexuality provokes, but the sex part, and not sex like actual sex, the concept of sex, the conceptual part is what I, I push back against. Um, so, but, so this is non-indigenous students who often bring up this issue of consent. And then one of my indigenous students, and this is just kind of emblematic of the kinds of conversations that, that happened uh, the last time I taught this course. And this student was raised in a rural indigenous community in the North, in a hunting community. And she, she showed up at class the first day with her new, like she'd had a baby two days before. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, and, and just, and I was so impressed that she came to class. I couldn't believe it. Um, and she said consent, she said consent. There's no consent in nature. She said, does that rain ask my consent when it falls on me? That tree branch could fall down and kill me. Like she just thought this was absurd to talk about. It was, so it was really interesting to send the, see them then work this out. But then I pressed back. And I said, you know, so there's this vibrant presence of traditional indigenous hunting communities, right, in lands now occupied by Canada. And we've got youth, young people, well, they're young to me because I'm 50, uh, who were raised on the trap line, right? And so I said, well, um, if not consent, what kinds of core principles do guide your people's relations with, with uh, other than human beings? You know, if consent doesn't work. And they really have to think about that. And I said, well, think in your language. What kinds of 
words or phrases do you use that guide your ethical interaction with these other than human beings? And I would bet it's a lot more complicated than consent, or it might not be consent at all. This is why we need to do theory in our indigenous languages, even if we don't speak them fluently. There are worldviews contained, and we know this when we're multilingual, right? It's not just indigenous languages. Anybody who's multilingual in different languages know this is why people are always resorting to French or Spanish or some other language to say something that they can't say in English. It's the same with, in, with indigenous languages. And so I said, you know, let's think about that. Um, sometimes we, we consume one another's bodies. We eat our relatives. You know, so we need to think, how, how does that work in an indigenous community that you eat your relative? We eat our relatives too. And I've... It, We've had lots of arguments on Media Indigenous, my regular podcast about veganism. I'm like, we eat our relatives. You can eat plants, but those are your relations. <laughs> so, and then this descends into a very interesting kind of conversation too about eating humans. So anyway, I think uh, we, this is what I push them towards, right? Like this is, this is what's interesting for me to think about. Um, if there's so much lost in translation between indigenous and non-indigenous analytical frameworks, we need to kind of bring those conversations to the fore and be very explicit about what frameworks of ethic, ethical frameworks that we're using to talk about these things. We can't just go to the, the current English word or movement of the day and try to indigenize that. So Beth and Annie have reminded me when I speak of ecosexualities, I get very serious about this, right? And they, they remind me when I speak about how generative it is that they're emphasizing playfulness and they think I'm taking it too seriously. But I think um, it's, it is serious because it's prompted me for six or seven years now to deconstruct the broader concept of sexuality. For the application of sex to one's relationship with the planet perplexes and is irksome for so many. Ecosexuality is theoretically generative even for indigenous studies uh, analyses of sex where I think it will gain very little traction in the indigenous community and that's okay. Um, it's great just to be in conversation. Okay, where's my little thing here? See, I'm getting off script and then I'm gonna have to cut stuff out. Because <laughs> so I like to tell stories. So let's talk about the indigenous eco-erotic. This is Melissa Nelson, um, who's Turtle Mountain Chippewa, a professor of American Indian Studies at San Francisco State. And she has the final chapter in this relatively new book by Joanne Barker, which I think is on Duke University Press. Duke and Minnesota are like all over indigenous studies and they run the show. I don't know what's going on with that. <laughs> Other presses need to hem in. But anyway, this is a great book, Critically Sovereign. And Joanne is also a professor of American Indian studies at, um, at San Francisco State as well. My, my great grandmother was enrolled in Melissa's tribe, all kinds of relations. So um, I'm gonna quote at length from Melissa's recent essay in uh, Barker's edited collection because in a way Nelson pulls apart the object of sex in this passage. And what I've learned in the last six years of engaging with ecosexuality is that sexuality as an object and concept might be ultimately incompatible with an indigenous logic of being in relation. And so here's that quote. This is from, uh, I don't have it up there, from her chapter, Getting Dirty, the Eco-Eroticism of Women in Indigenous Oral Literatures. In the face of such sensuous ecological encounters, both ordinary and spectacular, I step outside the sense of myself as a contained being. I am no longer a solid center, but part of an unending field of entwined energies. I am connecting to another greater life force, embodied in dirt, the material soil and source of matter. Whether watching a simple brown sparrow bathing in a mud puddle on a street, or smelling the aromatic heat off of a sage plant, these encounters stimulate arouse, awaken, and excite me in profoundly meaningful ways. They can break my heart open, take my breath away, make me shed tears, or force me to listen with the ears of my ancestors. In these moments, I often feel dwarfed, in awe, vulnerable, even shocked. And in the act of sex, I often feel these same emotions, these vulnerable feelings combined with a strange sense of authentic surging power. It is in these moments of disappearing and ego extinction in the sexual act that most of us find solace and bliss. She's being optimistic there, I think. I like that though. This relief from our persona helps us get in touch with a deeper sense of being, some would say a larger sense of self, an ecological or even cosmological self. So 
Before I talk about more recent work I've been doing related to more than monogamies and indigenous kin making, I'm going to continue from Melissa's very loving and intellectual spark in that passage, and I'm going to take more time to pull apart so-called sexuality itself. I think some of this is in the little piece you read, David Shorter, yeah. So one of the main theorists that I use to disaggregate sex and re-aggregate it back into relations is my friend David uh, Delgado Shorter. He teaches at UCLA where apparently you need to have a headshot like that. <laughs> it's not like that at University of Alberta. I'm glad that's a high standard to uphold. Anyway, you can get that off his website. So he's an anthropologist and indigenous studies scholar and I quote David. <clears throat> Sexuality is not like power, sexuality is a form of power. And of the forms of power, sexuality in particular might prove uniquely efficacious in both individual and collective healing. Further, I will suggest that sexuality's power might be forceful enough to soothe the pains of colonization and the scars of internal colonization. So in his essay simply entitled Sexuality, Shorter focuses on, and I apologize for my, my gringo accent, uh, Morea Kamem, healers, seers, powerful people among the OMA, and indigenous people living on both sides of the Mexico-US border. Of course, the border crossed them, right? He originally set out to understand the quote-unquote spiritual aspects of what they do to examine Morea Kamem as powerful healers. But his analysis has come to entangle both sexuality and spirituality. During his field work with Southern UMA and Sonora, an elder told Shorter that individuals who engage in non-monogamous and or non-heterosexual relationships are commonly also morea kamem. This is not always the case, but often it is. In fact, in Northern UMA communities in Arizona, morea kamem has come to be conflated with terms such as gay, lesbian, or two-spirit and other less positive terms. The healer or seer aspect of the word has been lost for UMA in the US who have much ethnic overlap with Catholic Mexican American communities as he describes it. So Shorter found that he could not understand the powerful spiritual roles in community of Morea Kamem without also understanding their so-called sexuality. He explains that in many indigenous contexts there is an interconnectedness in all aspects of life. So following the connections between sex and spirit among the UMA was akin to following a strand of a spider's web. In English, we are accustomed to thinking of spirituality or spirit, sexuality, or sex as things. With that ontological lens, Morea Kamen become an object, a class of person defined along either sexual and or spiritual lines. However, within their context, sexuality and spirituality can be seen both as actually constituted of human relational activities. They are sets of relations through which power is acquired and exchanged in reciprocal fashion among persons, not all of whom are human. In describing how relations or the relational sharing of power become things in a non-indigenous framework, Shorter uses this phrase, get ready, I make my undergrads write on this, objectivating the intersubjective. <laughs> In his spirituality essay, he explains that intersubjective, like related, emphasizes mutual connectivity, shared responsibility, and interdependent well-being. So we might think of sexuality, spirituality, and nature as not things at all, but as sets of relation in which power and sometimes material sustenance circulates. We might resist objectivating the intersubjective. We might resist hardening relations into objects that seem solidified, inherent, and ever constituted as such. A relational frame might help us be more attuned to relating carefully in practice as we consider the reverberations of our movements in the now across that web of relations. To return to Morea Kamem and resisting a classification of them as gay or non-monogamous, we can see them instead as relating. They have reciprocity with and receive power in their encounters with spirits, ancestors, dreams, and animals, and also in the human realm when they use their power to see for and heal other humans suffering from, say, love or money problems, addictions, and other afflictions of mind and body. Emphasizing relations and exchange, Shorter explains that the social role of Morea Kamem is not a means for individual self-empowerment. A Morea Kame does not identify themselves as such, although we identify them that way in order to refer to them. Morea Kamem do not accentuate their personal characteristics and capacities, i.e. their sexuality or their power to heal. Shorter explains that Morea Kamem focus rather on their work in community and that they work tirelessly and selflessly to maintain right relations. They resist having their relational 
uh, activities and power objectified. So understanding Maria Kamem relationality and community helps us to understand their so-called sexuality and maybe ours too as a form of reciprocity and power exchange. We can begin to unthread it from an object like gay or straight that is constituted once and unchanging. So-called sexuality is one form of relating and sharing of power that is reconstituted over and over based on the intersubjective dynamism of two or more persons. Shorter encourages us to see that for Moria Kamem and for all of us, sexuality can be understood, quote, as a way of being that directly and intentionally mediates social relations across the family, clan, pueblo, tribe, and other forms of relations, including other than human persons, unquote. With this understanding, sexuality begins to look more like a type of power, particularly one capable of healing. David Shorter does not reveal the details of Morea Kamem's sexual relations beyond noting their often non-normative sexualities. But his theoretical treatment of sexuality as relational power exchange is instructive for pondering how indigenous peoples and others might find ways in collectivity to oppose settler sexuality and marriage. Which brings me to another question. There's a lot of debate in Canada about indigenizing the academy, indigenizing this, indigenizing that, and debates about indigenization versus decolonization. Which is the better term? We ask that. Are they the same thing? So I've also heard calls for indigenizing sexuality. But what does that mean if the goal is to think relationally? I think the idea of indigenizing sexuality is actually oxymoronic. Rather, we might consider that one goal is to disaggregate so-called sexuality, not back to tradition, not forward into progress, but into and back out into that spider's web of relations. That is a web or a net in which relations exchange power, and power is intention, thus holding the web or community together. So I have a thought experiment. As part of decolonial efforts, can we work ourselves into a, a web of relations? And again, I, use, I insist on that web because I insist on space and not time I, to get away from progress. In small moments of possibility, can we resist naming sex between persons and sexuality as nameable objects? Can such disaggregation help us decolonize the ways in which we engage other bodies intimately, whether those are human bodies or bodies of water or land, the bodies of other living beings, and the vitality of our ancestors and other beings no longer or not yet embodied? By focus on actual states of relation, on being in good relation, on making kin, and with less monitoring and regulation of categories, might that spur more just interactions? <clears throat> so <laughs> you have to know Rez accents to really laugh at this guy, and you have to be able to imagine him saying this in his head. <laughs> Not that sacred. I, I don't say it like that. Anyway, he's hilarious. I laughed for about two hours when I first found that, put it on Facebook. <laughs> But humor is culturally specific, right? <laughs> All right, where am I here? So yeah, disaggregating spirit, reaggregating re relations. So we can also do the same thought experiment with spirituality or the sacred, for these ideas are also about relationality and engaging other bodies, both material bodies, such as the land and sometimes immaterial ones, the energy of our ancestors, their ongoing impressions in this material world. These relations are ill-captured by the English language word spirituality, and I personally can no longer use the word sacred. I, I just don't use it, because that implies profane, and I don't think things are profane. OK, so recall Melissa Nelson's much richer language than spirituality in her passage about communion between human bodies or between a human and a sage plant. Instead of spirituality, she writes about, and I've, I noticed this in multiple readings. It took me a while to notice this. That she doesn't use that word. She writes about sensuous ecological encounters an unending field of entwined energies connecting to another greater life force embodied in dirt, the material soil and source of matter, a strange sense of authentic surging power, a cosmological self. For me, the feeling she describes of connecting to another greater life force embodied in the material soil and source of matter, what breaks my heart open, takes my breath away, makes me shed tears, and forces me to listen with the ears of my ancestors is both communion with other human bodies and minds and with Earth. Some might say a higher power is involved, but is it not also awesome, the power that circulates through and between material bodies, including the planet and skies? Nelson recounts her erotic relationship with dirt as a child, eating it, taking it into her body. 
For me, it is not the taste of earth, but I take it deep into me through the related sense of smell. I experienced this kind of erotic moment last summer in Regina, so I found a picture of Regina. That's kind of what it looked like. Regina, Saskatchewan, as I lie in a hotel room bed with the light still in the sky about 1130 at night because that far north it stays light really late. I turned on my side toward the window and the curtains were wide open. I was about to slip to sleep before this vast thundering light show. And I went to sleep inhaling the scent of Earth's body, prairie soil lifted by rain. These are formative smells. I was born and raised near what is now the Minnesota-South Dakota border where the soil is rich and black and tumultuous skies tower over everything, bringing the quick hard rains of summer. So for me too, this is a vast field of entwined energies connecting to a greater life force, the skies with their powerful energy, life raised and embodied in dirt, the material soil and source of matter. I felt part of an authentic surging power, a cosmological self. So the spirit material divide of settler thought does us and the planet an immense intellectual and ethical disservice. We won't escape the moments when sex or sexuality, spirit or spirituality are the best that we can do in this particularly constituted English language. But can we lean towards disaggregating the objects of sex, spirit, and nature for that matter, and instead focus on promiscuously reaggregating relations? Can we see ourselves as relating and exchanging power and reciprocity in ways we now label as sex, spirituality, or nature? in support of a stronger extended kin network with both living relations and with those bodies we now come from and whose bodies will come in part from us. How much time do I have? 10 more minutes, okay. I think I can do it, okay. <laughs> So, <laughs> so I come to this newer work on sexuality and kin making via multiple parallel threads that suddenly veered together and Mark did a really good job, uh, better than I have, of describing that, that path. That's bra braided, kind of these threads that braid together in my work. So I was trained in the 1990s as a community and environmental planner before I began doing anthropology of science and earned a PhD in a humanities field in 2006. So I've been thinking about the politics of nature for a long time, long before becoming an academic. Uh, in 2013, I began writing anonymously a blog called The Critical Polyamorist. It was a way for me to think through my more than monogamy practice within a broader polyamory community that I found early on in Austin, Texas, to be just as settler colonial as monogamy world is. Uh, I found out that settler colonialism also shapes more critical approaches such as ecosexuality and polyamory, which continue to inhere object-oriented concepts like sexuality and nature that are challenging to reconcile with the indigenous relational ethics I promote. In addition, mainstream forms of polyamory privilege gender binary and couple-centric relationships and nuclear family forms that are constituted with settler colonial domination of land and resources. While ecosexuality, on the other hand, challenges to a much greater degree settler domination of land and resources, they just don't always use the term settler. But as interest in my blog grew and as I received speaking and interview invitations, and I like to do that, uh, and after I moved to Canada from Texas, I could no longer write anonymously. It was a pragmatic decision, but it was also a principled move to be open about more than monogamy. I felt challenged by all of the courageous young thinkers I increasingly encountered in indigenous studies across Canada, particularly on the Canadian prairies. These young two-spirit and queer indigenous students, activists and artists and scholars do not have the social capital or the economic security that I have, but they are nonetheless out in the face of much discrimination at the intersections of race, gender and sexuality in Canadian society and also with their, in their indigenous communities. So when I get I got asked recently in an interview, what would you say as a feminist scholar now moving into a kind of a senior position to young, young people? And I'm like, uh, I, around sexuality, I said I had nothing because they're the ones that I'm taking my lead from, actually. So I would tell them what they've already told me. <laughs> So writing The Critical Polyamorous helped me to see that my road to more than monogamy was informed by the politics of indigeneity, race, and political economy that began early in my life as I was nurtured within a Teoshpaye and Oyate. The Dakota word for extended family is Teoshpaye, uh, and the word for people, sometimes translated as nation, is Oyate. In reservation communities, the Teoshpaye hooks into the Oyate, and governance happens in ways that demonstrate the connections between the two. 
Beyond producing and caretaking extended biological relations, the Tioche Baie is also cultivated and nurtured by making kin. Dakota and other indigenous peoples build institutions to nurture made kin, and we have ceremonies of adoption. In my extended family, we also engage in legal adoption aided by the Indian Child Welfare Act that prioritizes adoption of indigenous children by tribal families and ongoing cultural connection. I think I have four adopted cousins. Indigenous peoples lobbied assertively for the legislation as one response of the Indian Child Welfare Act to the colonial kidnapping of children from families who were deemed unfit for not exhibiting the normative settler family structure. Despite much colonial violence against our families, we are in everyday practice still adept at kin making. Yet ironically, I was also subjected by both whites and indigenous peoples ourselves to narratives of shortcoming and failure. I regularly heard descriptions of Native American broken families, teenage pregnancies, unmarried mothers. I observed extreme serial monogamy, disruptions to nuclear family, and other failed attempts to paint our Tioche Baie over with a normative white middle class veneer. And I thought it was our failures to live up to that ideal that turned me off domesticity and marriage. And that's why I ran for coastal cities and higher education, why I asserted from a very early age that I would never marry, although I did, <laughs> because it's really hard to jump the railroad, the tracks of that railroad, right? It's really hard. Um, compulsory marriage, too. So this. And that was in, well, I won't, I need to run through this, so I won't do more storytelling. So I turned 50 in October, and I see now that it was not my family's so-called failures that dampened my enthusiasm for coupled domesticity. Rather, I was suffocating all my life under the weight of the aspirational ideal of middle-class nuclear family, including normative coupledom, even while I had lived contentedly, it turns out, a counter-narrative to that settler ideal. Unsurprisingly, the feeling of suffocation intensified after marriage, despite the feminist and anti-racist tendencies of my male co-parent, who was always our child's primary caretaker. <clears throat> I just could not shake my feeling of unease with the settler family structure, including its oppressive pronatalism. Of course, there were babies born into my extended Dakota family. People have sex, bodies beget life, but I did not see in my community a kind of pronatalism co-constituted with nation state building, an overture necessarily aimed at dispossessing indigenous peoples of our human and more than human relatives. Instead, and I have only just now put words to this, I grew up with an implicit mandate that our Tioche Baye must caretake kin across the generations as par part of caretaking the Oyate. Some of our kin are born to us, and some of them come to us in other ways. The roles of grandparents and aunties and uncles are revered, as are the roles of mothers and fathers. So I grew in a very pro-kinship world. But settler state oppression simultaneously sparked in me an explicit non-natalism that is central to my rejection of the US nationalist project. So if pro-natalism involves the middle class settler family structure, no matter the race or sexual orientation of the middle class family, I lament it. Decolonization can involve individual choices, but those are co-constituted with structural change. Therefore, we must also collectively oppose the settler system that marks indigenous and other relations as deviant. So we can make our intellectual theorizations and quote unquote lifestyle choices, some of us to a greater degree than others, but we must also prioritize policymaking that resists settler sexuality and railroads most of us into rigid relationship forms established to serve the heteronormative and increasingly also homonormative imperial state and its unsustainable private property institutions. Like five more minutes? I don't want to run over because social scientists do that all the time. You notice that when you're hanging out with genome scientists, they stay on time. OK. Um, so I talk in the, this slide. I was just going to sort of mention um, getting away from this, these ideas of lineal progressive kinds of progress, right? Uh, and I don't, I'm, I'm not somebody who says we need to go forward into progress or backwards into tradition. I'm, this is why that web analytic is so useful, right? To think about reconstituting relations in the now, um, to avoid thinking that eventually we'll get there. We just have to hold fast to the current project, and that's always on the backs of the marginalized and exploited, and of course we never get there. Versus thinking about how every action on this web is in tension with every other action on the web. And so then we've got to fo focus in the here and the now, wherever that here and the now is. And it can be physical, but it can also be virtual, right? 
Um, so that's kind of w where I'm going with thinking about uh, what the kin making project look like, looks like and how that's kind of very critical of the settler state. I also was going to talk about in this slide the imposition of English language contemporary concepts onto my whole speaking about this, right? It doesn't make any sense to talk about my ancestors being genderqueer or straight or cisgender. None of that makes sense because that's not the structure within which they lived. Their roles and their bodies and their practices were constituted differently. This is why I would never talk about indigenizing sexuality now or why I no longer teach a class called indigenizing queer theory. It doesn't make sense. You can't indigenize it. Um, but rather, uh, this is why I'm advocating that our, that our students and our people, not that we, need, we are in conversation clearly, as you'll see with my final slides, with uh, non-Indigenous queer theory. And that's incredibly productive um, because non-Indigenous queer folks make kin. They've had to make kin. They seem to me to focus a lot on relationality. This is why we need to be at the same conversational table. This is how I came to feminism because I saw feminists critiquing the, the, the way that the scientific gaze made women's bodies deviant. I've come into conversation with crip theorists for the same reason, right? So being at these conversational tables, making similar kinds of critiques of, of science and knowledge production that's been central to settler colonialism that has disenfranchised and oppressed us all. So, so I am thinking a lot about language and how to use language. Um, and then I just was going to sort of close with a, a plea about decolonization projects. You know, we're so quick in indigenous studies to critique blood talk, um, particularly blood talk and private property, but monogamy and, and state sanctioned marriage were tied up with blood and monogamy, intimately tied up. We can't not go after that. So um, it's, it's all part of a package. And so I'm going to close with some images. Um, that I, that I think kind of make some of these connections uh, more clear and they do it in a less time than I can do this in words. So I don't think settler relations are all that we're stuck with. I don't think this is how it has to be. So this is, you know, conquering nature. This is the, what happened to that land. Such a terrible trade-off, such a poor excuse for indigenous genocide. But I'm an equal opportunity picker on her. For those of you that don't know, that's Wab Canoe. He's an Anishinaabe. I like Wab, but he's the head of the uh, NDP in Manitoba. Settler family constructs, we're all aspiring to those. Settler cultures, notions of love, marriage, and family, and heteronormative, homonormative, human-centric, and mononormative forms do not have to be all there is. I don't know where this is. Settler relations with land and water do not have to be all there is. We must imagine differently. So think of all the violence that is tied up with the killing and suffering it continues to take to impose these norms of relating around the world. Cree Métis feminist Kim Anderson reminds us that one of the biggest targets of colonialism was the indigenous family. I expand that to indigenous relations. The biggest target of colonialism continues to be the disruption of our vast complex webs of relating. They undercut our webs of relations, they kill us. It's that simple and taking the land is central to that. I will my faith, myself to have faith that settler intimacies do not have to be all there be. There is. We must not conflate a love for these lands and waters with a love for violent states. This is no more true for me after Trump than it was before. We must think about how to stand in alliance with relatives, both each other as humans and with our more than human relatives, who are suffering across the planet from the ongoing violence that is the American dream, and that dream is evangelized by all the political parties. None of them are going to save us. I know I moved to Canada. It's easy for me to say that. I recognize. <laughs> These are my formative theorists, though. Well, my mom was my formative theor theorist, then Vine Deloria Jr., but I don't cite these. Uh, I show these women because these are my theorists now. I've learned more about theory than I have activism because I'm more of a theory head than an activist from No Dapple. Um, they are connecting in the defense of indigenous lands, relations, and treaty rights to the defense of the earth for all of us. That's, that's a really important theoretical move. They did it at No Dapple. 
They're doing it at Idle No More. They did it with Idle No More. That's Candy Brings Plenty, who I think was the founder of the Two Spirit Camp at, uh, at No Dapple. They took a lot of advice from the women of Idle No More. Women, queer, and two spirit folks are leading the way and doing this kind of theorization of rethinking relations. That's who I'm taking my, uh, I was talking to somebody earlier, like they're gonna save us, but <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm taking a lot of theoretical, and I did have, oh, I took it out. Um, I also think about Black Lives Matter, but I need to study Black Lives Matter more in this way. I see women and, and queer folks thinking about, I don't know if caretaking is the right word though, but I, but I notice that that's who's leading the way in terms of pushing back against these kinds of state, state hegemony, and I know what's going on here. Anyway, I'll leave you with my blessing from my critical polyamorous blog. May your networks of love and relations be many and not caged within settler colonial norms of rapacious individualism, hierarchies of life, and ownership of land, waters, bodies, and desires. Thank you. <laughs>